Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Eckhart Mangakan from the University of Toronto. He will give three lectures. Uh, the first one uh, now, uh, the title is Symplectic Geometry of Calculus Spaces for Surfaces with Boundaries. Okay, well, first of all, thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, always a pleasure to be in this wonderful city. <laughs> um, so th this is the first of um, three lectures, as um, Katja pointed out. Um, so so th this is basically the title of, of the lecture series. And it's all based on joint work with Anton Alexeyev, uh, based on two papers, one which has just appeared, at least as an online version, uh, in Journal of Geometry and Physics, and one, uh, well, it's a preprint which should have been out by now, but um, yeah, hopefully in a week or two, it will finally be on the archive. Well, that's that's uh, what, what they give me. So, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's like when you buy a new car, it's always for the next year. Mm -hmm. but, but it's actually available online and the online version um, of, of this, pub this published online version is better than uh, the preprint version. So some mistakes have been corrected. Not all, but some. Okay, so I'm gonna do this first uh, lecture mostly as an introduction to uh, Virasoro algebras and the Virasoro coach on action. Um, let's start with some motivation. Well, really motivation for this whole project. Yeah, so we're motivated by um, some uh, recent works in physics on JT gravity, Jakif Teitelboim gravity, uh, in which appear these uh, moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces with a wiggly boundary. Uh, so maybe I should actually start with a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, Anton and I have not done any work in uh, JT gravity. And speaking for myself, I basically don't even know what JT gravity is. So our motivation was, was really just, just to, to look at these papers in the sense of looking at them as opposed to reading them. Uh, mostly just looking at the pictures as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so so they, they had some pictures that looked like this. Uh, these surfaces which develop funnel ends, uh, they call them trumpets. So we adopted the name trumpets because it sounds more funny. Uh, but then the boundary gets cut off at infinity. Um, so what they're explaining to us is, uh, well, they uh, start out with this um, action functional for JT gravity, which has a topological term, which is the Euler characteristic. So the way they phrase it is, is that, it's, that it's really um, the um, Einstein-Hilbert action uh, with a boundary correction term, but in two dimensions, it's just the right-hand side of the Gauss-Bonnet formula, so it's just the Euler characteristic. So only, if you have only that term with the Euler characteristic, uh, not really interesting physics appears, just a topological term. But then there's this extra term, uh, which is uh, JT gravity term. So in this formula, uh, K is the Gauss curvature. Um, little k, so which is this uh, integral over the boundary, uh, is the geodesic curvature of the boundary. And this uh, field phi is what they call a dilaton field. And yeah, as you can imagine, when you um, vary uh, things, you roughly get surfaces, which is Gauss, Gauss curvature equal to negative one and geodesic curvature of the boundary equal to plus one. Yeah, and then they explain to us that they're doing these path integrals and then doing them in stages. And after the first stage, they end up with integrals over these uh, cutout surfaces. So surfaces with these funnel ends, as, as I just said, but the boundary has been removed. So actually the integral over the surface makes sense it's because the funnel ends, they would have infinite volume. So the integrals converge. Uh, beyond that, uh, the details of those physics papers are really somewhat obscure to me, to be honest. So, so they're doing some path integral over um, metrics like this with a path integral over all weekly boundaries, whatever that means. So I, I don't quite know what that means. So just take it like that. Right, so, so 
at first sight from a ma mathematics pr perspective, you might be a little skeptical that this is a reasonable thing to do, but then we, again, look at those papers without actually reading them, and we see that lots of interesting math terms appear. There's Schwarzian derivatives in the picture, Gerozor algebra, deustermann heckmann measure, they get to the Mizukani recursion relations, um, and there's ran random matrix three, topological recursion, so all these things appear, and so maybe there's something to it, and so, so we wanted to have some sort of interpretation. So w what we came up with, and I'm not even sure if at the end it, it's really significant or relevant for JT gravity, is that one has some infinite Teichmüller space in the picture. So we, we're looking at these spaces with boundary, uh, surfaces with boundary, and we're looking at so-called conformally compact hyperbolic surfaces, uh, hyperbolic metrics on the surface with boundary. So the, these are metrics that, towards the end, uh, to, uh, along the boundary, look like the metric on the Poincaré disk, up to diffeomorphisms fixing the boundary. So this would still be an infinite dimensional space, because the diffeomorphisms of the boundary would still act on that space. And yeah, our claim is, our, our result is that this space actually has a natural symplectic structure and the action of the diffeomorphisms of the boundary um, will be Hamiltonian Verrazzaro action. So we're recovering a bit of, of this physics um, terminology. I again, it's not entirely clear if it's actually relevant for what they are doing. There's also a bit of motivation from mathematics, things that we've been working on many years ago on Hamiltonian loop group spaces. I'm always going to use this as a bit of an analogy. So in that context, one uh, looks at some connected Lie group with an invariant metric. So LG denotes the loop group, so all maps from a circle into that group. And then there's a notion of Hamiltonian loop group space. So some infinite dimensional symplectic manifold on which the loop group acts, and it should act with an equivariant moment map. I've, I've written down the mode map condition. What's um, important here is that the mode map is equivariant, but uh, equivariant for the gauge action. So not, not the pointwise cojoint action, but for the gauge action. So our target of the mode map is really um, the space of connections on a circle. So when I write this LG hat star one, what I'm, I'm saying is that we really have in mind the central extension of the loop group. This is LG hat. And then we look at the dual space, which comes with a map to R, and then this is the level, the, the FN hyperplane at level one. So as is well known, this is identified with the space of connections, and this is what the moment map takes values in. So we've been studying these spaces many years ago, worked with Chris Woodford especially, and one of our main examples was indeed for a surface with boundary. So for a surface with boundary, you look at the space of all flat connections on the surface up to gauge transformations which fix the boundary. So on that space, one still has the gauge transformations of the boundary, which is the loop group. And indeed, this is a, a Hamiltonian space. The mode map is just pulling back a connection to the boundary. So this is the motivating example, and so, so the picture that we have for these potential Hamiltonian Verrazzaro space is somewhat similar. And anyway, we always wanted to develop this theory of Hamiltonian Verrazzaro spaces because for loop group spaces, the, uh, we found that there's a nice correspondence between um, yeah, Hamiltonian loop group spaces and so-called quasi-Hamiltonian G spaces. It doesn't really matter what exactly they are. The point is that um, on the left side, we have things that are always infinite dimensional. On the right side, we can translate this into some finite dimensional gadget. So you, similar to usual symplectic manifolds with mode maps, however, the axioms are a little bit different, but they're finite dimensional usually. And yeah, we could uh, put this correspondence to good use because for Hamiltonian loop group spaces, one's sort of knows what one wants to do if one knows what one usually does with mode maps and symplectic geometry. 
there's only this technical issue that everything is infinite dimensional and not always clear how to make sense of things. So we can translate this onto the finite dimensional side where it's all somewhat non-standard, but at least we're in finite dimensions and we can try to make sense of everything. And so this, this program we could uh, put to good use for, for one thing, we could find many more examples of um, Hamiltonian loop group spaces in this way by constructing quasi-Hamiltonian G spaces. There's some Dostomat Heckman theory in the picture. So for symplectic manifolds, um, one is always interested in the top exterior power of the symplectic form, the, that's the Liouville measure. And then if you push forward on the mode map, that's the famous Dostomat Heckman measure. But an infinite dimension taking the top exterior power doesn't really make sense. And so there, there's a problem there. But it turns out on the finite dimensional side, it, it does make sense. And so it could be developed. And so in some sense, we have just my Heckman theory for Hamiltonian loop group spaces in this way. Uh, could do things with intersection pairings, quantization, and various other things. So this, this worked quite well. And so we wanted to have similar things for Verazoro as opposed to loop groups. So this is, yeah, this the, the first pre, uh, preprint. Uh, as a preprint, it was in uh, 22. As a journal paper, as it has appeared in 24. So, yeah, so we found a similar correspondence between certain types of Hamiltonian Verazoro spaces and certain types of quasi-Hamiltonian spaces for the group PSL2R, which are then finite dimensional. And so we, we are hoping um, similar applications. So yeah, we can get some new examples of Hamiltonian Verazoro spaces. Uh, because in, in terms of old examples, the, the only one would, one would think of would be Corrigan orbits. And so with these surfaces, we already get some new examples. There's some Heckman measures maybe, um, so that's not really worked out yet. Intersection pairings, who knows, quantization. So some further applications are very much work in progress. So, so in progress, we haven't even started on them yet. Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, let me give you an introduction to Virazoli algebra. So I have to say, when, when I started working on this project, I didn't even know really anything about Virazoli algebra except for just the plain definition. And so I don't expect that you know much more than I did two years ago. <laughs> and so, so let, let's give some overview, but just to be different, I want to do everything coordinate free. Uh, so the, the principle uh, that one uses here, okay, I should say, of course, Verazoro Lie algebra is a central extension of the Lie algebra vector fields on a circle. And I want to explain how you construct this central extension. So the principle for how one constructs central extension is the following. Uh, whenever you have a group, a Lie group, acting on an affine space with a property that the underlying linear action is just a coagent action. And with a property uh, that uh, the screw symmetry uh, holds. So in this formula, uh, when I write, uh, so X and Y are uh, elements of the Lie algebra of K. Y dot U, that would be the infinitesimal action. So that lies in the tangent space. So it's an element of K dual. So pairing it with X makes sense. Right, so, so mu is an element in the affine space, but then y dot mu is a tangent vector, so it lies in k star. So pairing makes sense, and this pairing should be screw symmetric in x and y. So whenever you're in this situation, you automatically get a central extension in such a way that uh, when you look at the dual and then look at the level one uh, affine hyperplane, that's the uh, initial um, affine space. So you could say it's, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Because if you have a central extension, then you could reverse the process. You would dualize and then look at the affine hyperspace at level one. So this is the, the principle we can always use. So how, how does it actually go? Well, it's very simple. Um, the central extension as a vector space is just the space of affine linear functionals on E. That's a vector space. And the bracket is given by 
this true symmetric form. So in, in this formula, x hat and y hat would be affine linear functionals. x and y are the underlying linear functionals. And that's how you do it. That's all. So this is the principle that's, that's always at work. And, and yeah, let me explain how this works, uh, first of all, for the gauge group. So we're looking again at setting that we have a, a connected Lie group with an invariant metric on its Lie algebra. We have a principal G bundle over a circle. So if I take it to be trivial, then, then I will look at the loop group, but let's even look at a non-trivial principal G bundle. And then we have the group of gauge transformations. So diffeomorphisms which uh, commute with the gauge action, with the principal action, diffeomorphisms which uh, commute with the principal action and induce the identity on the base. So it's just fiberwise. Mm -hmm. The Lie algebra of the gauge group are functions uh, on, on the base with values in this uh, adjoint bundle. Mm -hmm. Sections of the adjoint bundle, you could say. Mm -hmm. And then we have the space of connections, which is an affine space over one forms with values in the adjoint bundle. And you see, because you have a metric, there's a pairing between the two, right? So given something in the here and something in there, you could just take uh, the metric, you get an ordinary one form, and you integrate over the circle, that's the pairing. Okay, and then you have the gauge action on the space of connections, and this is exactly the setting that we have. The underlying linear action is the cogent action. You have to check that this pairing has this true symmetry property, but it's the setting, so you get a central extension. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. So again, the special case, if uh, it's a trivial bundle, then the gauge group would be the loop group, and then this is the central extension of the Lie algebra of the loop group. Okay, I want to do the same thing now for vector fields on a circle. But to, to, to make clear that everything is really coordinate free, I'm actually going to use an abstract circle. So not a circle with a parameterization. So I'm using a compact oriented one manifold. So a union of circles if you want, but abstract circles. Okay, and vect C is the uh, Lie algebra vector fields and I want to define a central extension. So to do this, according to my principle, I have to find this affine space on which the group, which is diffeomorphism of the circle acts. And this affine space is the space of Hill operators. Okay, to do that, uh, yeah, so, so my apologies to Nigel. <laughs> so, so we have to look at space of, of, of densities. So Nigel gave these wonderful uh, lectures at the Fields Institute uh, this, this fall. It was a real treat and I learned lots of things. And one of the things I learned was that Nigel doesn't like densities. <laughs> 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 and so, so here it comes. So here we really need densities. So locally it's expressions like this fx, dx to the r. This tells you how they transform under diffeomorphisms. Uh, for example, zero densities are just functions. One densities are just the same thing as one forms because I have an orientation. Minus one densities would be vector fields, right? So the duality between one forms and vector fields is just, um, you just multiply them together. Hmm? So you, if you multiply them, you need to get a zero density and that's the function. Two densities um, are called quadratic differentials. But now, um, since we're in one dimension, uh, that's actually the dual space to vector fields. Again, how does the duality go? You just multiply them together, then you get a one density, and you integrate over the circle. That's the pairing. Okay, so our affine space that we're looking for should be an affine space with underlying linear space, the quadratic differentials. And that's the space of Hill operators. No, Nigel's really not gonna like this. So, so, so it acts on, on minus one half densities. It takes values in three half densities. 
with a property, it's a second order differential operator, so like, like some kind of Laplacian, from minus one half densities to plus three half densities with the property that's self adjoint and the principal symbol is equal to one. So uh, if you see it for the first time, it looks horrible with, with these uh, minus one half and so on. But if, if you think about it, it's the only numbers that actually make sense. Because in order to say that it's self-adjoined, um, I need to be sure that the dual operator acts between the same spaces. So minus one half and three half, they're dual to each other. Again, multiplication followed by integration. So, so that, that's why it actually makes sense. And the principal symbol of uh, an operator acting between density spaces would usually itself be some sort of density, right? Some, some of second symmetric power of the tangent bundle tensor with homomorphisms, but in, the mo in one dimension. So it's some density bundle of some degree, but I want it to be a function. So to say that it's equal to one. And this is the only numbers for which it works. Okay, so that's, that's the space. And yeah, it's an affine space over the space of quadratic differentials. So if I have a, such a second order differential operator, I can just add a quadratic differential, it's another one. And because everything is coordinate free, the diffeomorphism group acts on it. That's an affine action. And so I'm exactly in my setting. I have to check the screw symmetry property, but it's fine. And so we get a central extension. And that's the Vera Zorili algebra defined in a coordinate free way. Okay, so, so, so the action on the space of Hill operators, that's, that's what we refer to as the coercion and Vera Zorro action. Any, any questions about this? So, so th that's what it is coordinate free. So let, let's also say what it is in coordinates. So, so now let's take the circle to be an actual circle. So you, you can figure out, uh, so if, if, you, if you have coordinates then everything gets trivialized, the densities just become functions. You just have to keep track on how they transform. But yeah, so, so the density bounds, everything gets trivialized. And, and so you can figure out what is um, the central extension in terms of a co-cycle and it's this famous Gelfan Fuchs co-cycle. Uh, the Hill operators, they are just like um, Schrödinger operators. So we could say Schrödinger Hill operator is just a Schrödinger operator on circle. Right? But yeah, strictly speaking, acting on minus one half densities. Mm -hmm. So the uh, potential in this context is then called the Hill potential. Yeah, but the interesting thing is how does diffeomorphism actually act on these things and you work it out and what pops out is this formula. So there are two terms to the formula. Um, so it's, it's easier to say how does the inverse of diffeomorphism act. So roughly speaking, uh, the inverse of diffeomorphism acts by pullback. So this is this first term, but we are remembering that we are basically dealing with quadratic differentials. So that's why this f prime squared appears. But it's an affine action, so there's another term, and this extra term is the famous or infamous Schwarzian derivative. So that, that's what one gets if one actually goes through the motions and works out all the formulas. Okay, so that's my review of Vera's Zorili algebra. So far so good. So now let's uh, think about the classification of coagent orbits. Um, so maybe I should remind you where we're at. So I'm saying the space of Hill operators is first star one of C and diffeomorphisms act on this space. So it plays, plays the role of a coagent action and we are interested in the space of orbits. Okay. So first of all, I uh, look at the same problem, not for Hill operators, but for connections. So if you're on the principal bundle, let me set this is, um, well, LG star, or if you want gauge G one star, right? With the action of the gauge group. And the 
can look at its cohesion orbits. So I, I first want to look at that problem and then look at the problem for Verazoro. Okay, so it's a well-known fact that the gauge orbits in the space of connections are classified by conjugacy classes. And loosely speaking, the classification is given by taking the monotony of a connection around the circle. Let's say in, in a bit more detail how this goes. Okay, so given the principal bundle of a circle, we can pull it back to the real line. And then I'm looking at the space of quasi-periodic sections of this pullback bundle. These are sections that um, you could say if I go around the circle once, I pick up a monotony. A space of quasi-periodic sections. One way to think about it is um, if you have a connection on a principal G bundle, then you couldn't look at its uh, horizontal sections. But uh, if it's of a circle, they wouldn't close up. Right, so if you go around the circle, it picks up a monotony. So that's why I'm going to the real line, so, so it actually makes sense to write it globally. And then I get a quasi-periodic section as, as a kind of horizontal section for a connection. Yeah, so what we then get is some diagram like this. And maybe, maybe I actually want to copy it over because we're going to, I mean, this, this kind of diagram is going to be on almost every slide from now on. But nevertheless, Maybe nice to have it on the blackboard too. These kind of roof diagrams we, we're using a lot. So we get a diagram like this. Um, so what are the arrows here? Uh, one arrow is because, as I just explained, uh, if I have a connection, then it gives rise to a, a quasi-periodic sections. Once I fix a base point, conversely, uh, given a quasi-periodic section, it basically tells me what the connection is because I know what, what, what is horizontal. So th this is uh, the left arrow. At the same time, it's a, a quotient map under the action of G, right? Just, just changing the initial point for my quasi-periodic section. Uh, what's the right map? Well, the, the right map is just taking the monotony of my quasi-periodic section. And that, as it happens, is just a quotient map under the national action of gauge transformations. So on this space SP, I have a national action of gauge transformations. And that's just a quotient map. So we have this nice uh, roof diagram. And it, yeah, it's, it's really nice because both of these actions are actually principal actions. They're, they're free and it's locally trivial. And so, so every, everything is very nice. So because of this diagram, you can then see if, if you take the quotient first by G and then the quotient by gauge transformations, it's the same thing as taking the quotient by gauge transformation and then by G. So that's why they're the same. So th this explains the classification of cohesion orbits for a gauge group. Okay. Actually, it's, it's even better than that. You get more from, from this diagram. It's not just a coincidence of the orbit spaces, it's a Morita equivalence of the actions. So the actions have the same stabilizer, same normal representations, kind of the transverse geometry is the same. So it's, 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 it's more than just a coincidence of, of orbits. So to say this a bit more fancy, we have a Morita equivalence of the action groupoids. That, that's what our space S of P actually gives. So. Over G, we have the action group part for the conjugation action. Over space of connection, we have the action group part for the gauge action. So S of P gives a Morita equivalence. Very nice. Okay, now we want to do similar thing for Vera Zorro. Okay, so it's, it's uh, a result that was um, obtained independently by, by uh, Graham Siegel and Bill Goldman in 1980. The, the, the fact that the cohesion Verozor orbits are classified by certain conjugacy classes in a certain open subset of the universal cover of SO2R. 
So there, there are other versions of classification, some of them earlier. But, but this version is just the one I'm, I'm interested in. And they came up with it independently. And yeah, I want to explain this, this um, identification by a similar kind of roof diagram. So first of all, uh, let's give a picture of the universal cover of SL2R. Uh, I mean, you know, SL2R is just um, the interior of a torus. For example, by um, Cartan decomposition, right? It's, it's just S1 times R2 by Cartan decomposition. So if you take the universal cover of S1 times R2, you get R3. And this is the picture of R3 and in other words, of the universal cover of SO2. And you should th think of this as uh, being rotated around this horizontal axis. And, and these, these uh, lines, uh, which again have to be rotated to create surfaces, uh, those, those lines signify the conjugacy classes. So in particular, these, these nodes uh, would be the center of SL2R. The green lines would be uh, the elliptic conjugacy classes. The blue ones would be the parabolic conjugacy classes. The red ones would be the hyperbolic conjugacy classes. So if you take the quotient, if you get a picture of the space of conjugacy classes, you get some non hausdorff space, which looks like this. So in this picture, the horizontal line would be those elliptic Gaussian orbits again, with the nodes being the central elements. The vertical lines correspond to the hyperbolic orbits, and those dots correspond to the parabolic ones. Right, and I said for a classification of Verizor Kirchhoff orbits, we, we only get a certain open subset of this space. And the open subset I can explain in terms of this picture is basically half of it. So everything that's just to the right of the zero line is included. Uh, zero itself is not included as a, as a, as a central element and, and also uh, only one of these parabolic elements is included, only things on the right. Oh, the, the, the pl plus here just basically means the, the right side. So I, I was saying zero zero coordinate orbits um, are classified by certain conjugacy classes in in the universe cover SL two R, and and those those are the certain conjugacy classes. So in this at this point, the plus just means the right half if you want. Okay, and. Yeah, the, the way we get it is again by, by these rooftop diagrams. And yeah, so I wanna again, despite the fact that we're using it on basically every slide, I'm, I'm gonna redraw it just, just so we keep it in mind. Developing maps, uh, hill operators, and here's uh, a certain unit subset of universal cover of SL2R. So we're gonna have a diagram like this. So I have to explain what this diagram is. So first of all, what is this D of S1? D of S1 is the space of developing maps. So by definition, a developing map is an oriented local diffeomorphism from the real line to RP1, which is quasi-periodic again just like those quasi-periodic sections. So there, there's some monodromy again in the picture, which lives in PSL2R. So th this comes from the theory of projective structures. Um, so, so on RP1, we have a projective structure, and then if you have uh, this kind of property, then you can pull the projective structure back and, and you get a projective structure on the circle. So that's, that's where it comes from. So that's, that's a developing map. So D of S1 is the space of all developing maps. That's what we have at the top of this roof diagram. And what are the two maps P and Q? Uh, first of all, the map P, um, yeah, basically explaining it the other way around again. Uh, if you have a hill operator, then you can look at, uh, it's a differential operator, so you can look at space of solutions. Take a fundamental system of solutions. 
with Ronskin equal to negative one can make, make that normalization. So it's, it's one of the beauties of doing it with minus one half density, so the Ronskin actually is a scalar. And it's well defined in this scalar. Mm -hmm. So you take, take a fundamental system of solutions. Um, as we know from ODE theory, uh, they don't have common zeros, so you can take their ratio, so, so to speak, as, as a map to RP1, and that's your developing map. And conversely, if you have this developing map, then you recover the operator. So, so because if you have the developing map, then you have these solutions up to uh, some, some constant. And once you know a pair of solutions, then you can reconstruct the operator. So you can go back. And this is this map P. Yeah, similar to what we had before, it's at the same time, um, the quotient map for the natural action of PSL2R on the space of developing maps. Same story as before. So that's the map P. What's the map Q? Um, okay, by definition, developing maps have this monotony, but uh, the map should take values in the universal cover. So one basically lifts everything to universal cover. So given a developing map, which takes values in RP1, we um, lift it to a map into the real line. So this would be this map phi. In other words, I, I, I write the developing map like this, sine phi, cosine phi. So in some sense, phi is just a lift of the map gamma to the universal cover of RP1. And then it's quasi-periodic as a map to the real line, but now on the real line, uh, the action is of the universal cover of, of PSL2R, right? PSL2R acts on RP1, and then the universal cover acts on the universal cover. So th this is uh, what this H tilde then is. It's like the lifted monotony, you could say. Right. And yeah, maybe you can vaguely understand uh, why we only get half of the universal cover in this way. Uh, it has to do with the fact that I require my developing maps to be orientation preserving local diffeomorphisms. So in some sense, um, this map phi, it can only move things to the right. That's where it comes from. So you don't get all the monotomies, you only get the ones which are in some sense positive, which moves things to the right. Yeah, and as it happens, just like that before, um, on the space of developing maps, you also have an action of the universal cover, I should say, of the group of diffeomorphisms of the circle. Um, because this universal cover can be identified as diffeomorphisms of the real line, which commute with integer translations. And Q is just the quotient map for that. So almost the same story that, like we had for gauge groups. And so we get this diagram, the two maps being the quotient maps, and yeah, the, by the same uh, reasoning, we can get this, this result of classification of orbits. So everything is basically the same, um, but not quite. There's this one small point that is different. It's actually not a Morita equivalence of actions in this case. And the reason is that, um, okay, one of those actions is a principal action. The other one is not a principal action. It has some finite, it, not finite, it has some discrete stabilizers. So th there's a small difference here. And one can actually see, um, if one looks at uh, these actions of diffeomorphisms on, uh, on Hill operators and PSL2R by conjugation, that the stabilizers on, don't, don't quite match. So there's a small point there. Yeah, but aside from the small point, it's all good. And it turns out we, we still get some Morita equivalence of some groupoids. On the right side, um, it's again the action groupoid for conjugation action. On the left side, we just have to be a bit more careful. We could look at um, the action groupoid for diffeomorphisms. Um, I think it should actually be the tilde. 
I'm not, not quite sure. I have to look in the paper. That, that might be it uh, for, the, for the universe cover. Um, but uh, it's not quite that we have to take a quotient. Basically, we just have to quotient out these uh, discrete stabilizers. So after we quotient it out, it's no longer an action groupoid, but it's still a groupoid. And you would get a Morita equivalence. So it's still a nice picture. Any questions at this stage? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's something infinite dimensional, but it's, it's uh, if, if you wish, infinite dimensional smooth. Yeah, so, so th th that's actually some, something that um, got us very much confused. Um, so, so it feels like if you have um, some um, stabilizer for an action, you just quotient out, usually uh, things are no longer smooth and you, you get into trouble. It turns out we, we don't get into trouble. And I can ma maybe make a cartoon version of, of what's going on. So it's, it's, it's roughly uh, the way it works. And it's basically exactly what, what, what happens for the elliptic orbits. Uh, if you look at the quotient of R2 by an equivalence relation, X, Y is equivalent to X, Y plus one over X for X non-zero. You take this equivalence relation. So this. Hmm? So for x equals zero, you don't quotient anything. Otherwise, it's, it's, someone goes like this. The quotient by this equivalence relation is smooth. Hmm? So th this is roughly how the action goes. And, and for that reason, it's still smooth. What's an example? Uh, so, so, so the, these, these stabilizers, they're all um, exactly like here. They're all isomorphic to either integers or uh, trivial. It, it is actually easy to explain uh, uh, in terms of, of example. Uh, I should have actually maybe given some examples of these developing maps. What's an example of such a map which is quasi-periodic? Um, you can take gamma of x equals sine of alpha x, cosine alpha x, for some real number alpha. And yeah, so th these are developing maps and the corresponding um, Verrazoro cohesion orbits are exactly these elliptic ones. And if you now look at the action of diffeomorphisms here, uh, um, so this diff ZR uh, action, it has stabilizers, uh, um, one over alpha times Z, um, maybe with the two pi or so, right? Because if, if you shift it over like this, it doesn't change. So that, that, that's how some of these stabilizers arise. And, and this, this, this is really the only kind of stabilizer that arises. What, what you can see is that these stabilizers are not always the same, they're not constant. But uh, yeah, luckily as alpha goes to zero, um, they just go up like, like in this picture and therefore there's no problem. Right. Okay, so in remaining min minutes, I want to say uh, actually what, what we have done. Well, we have done some of, of this with details about the stabilizers, but uh, we are mostly interested in, in some of the actual geometry that can form spaces. Because, um, yeah, the, these, these quotient orbits are not just orbits for an action, they also have these symplectic structures on them. So there's some extra differential geometry in the picture. And we also want to capture that in terms of diagrams. 
Um, so let's first of all go back again to the gauge group um, example. So what, what we had um, found many, many years ago in 2009 uh, is that on the space of uh, quasi-periodic sections, um, there's a canonical two form, which is invariant under all the symmetries that you have. It's under, uh, invariant under the G action, uh, which defines this quotient map P, but it's, it's also invariant under gauge transformations, even in, uh, invariant under all automorphisms. So it has a huge symmetry group and has the property that its differential is equal to the pullback of uh, the three form which you have on the group G. So in this formula, theta L would be the left invariant model Carta form. And so this expression is the three form which you have on the group G. And so the differential of this bar pi form is, is the pullback of this three form. From some perspe perspective, it's really remarkable that you have such a form. Um, uh, I mean, it's not so difficult to see that this space S of P is, uh, so to speak, contractible, even as a canonically defined retraction. Um, and so if you pull back a closed three form under this map, it becomes exact. And so some formula like this should exist, of course. But um, the remarkable thing is that you can make it in vain under this huge symmetry because you don't have any averaging at your disposal. And yeah, so, so but there, there's an explicit formula. Mm. And we also know what its contractions are with the generating vector fields for the G action. And we know what its uh, contractions are with the generating vector fields for the gauge action. This term here is basically what one has on the right-hand side for Hamiltonian uh, loop group actions. In this case, uh, gauge P actions. Yeah, and it's, it's this diagram uh, which we then use to get our correspondences. So f f first of all, I should say um, this correspondence which we had for the group points, we can soup up and we have two forms in the picture. This group point is a symplectic group point. It's, it's roughly like the cotangent bundle of, of the gauge group, except here things are centrally extended. So that's where the subscript one is there. So there, there's a symplectic form on it, like a cotangent bundle symplectic form. And on this uh, other action group, there's also a two form, which is not symplectic. It's what we call quasi symplectic from our theory of group valued mode maps. And there's a Morita equivalence. So this varpi gives a Morita equivalence between the things, but taking into account two forms. Mm -hmm. And so this is then what we use to get our correspondence between Hamiltonian spaces for the two things. So in particular, one gets corresponds between uh, gauge orbits, cotangent orbits and conjugate classes, but now taking into account the symplectic structures. So for Virozoro, we have the same thing. So we constructed, again, some two form on this space, which is invariant under all the symmetries that you have, and which has exactly the same kind of properties. And so we get some Morita equivalence of group points, but now with the two forms in the picture, which in some sense says that uh, this corresponds between the Poisson structure on, on, uh, on the dual Virozoro and some structure which we have on SL2R. And so from that one then obtains some correspondence between Hamiltonian spaces, um, but it's certain Hamiltonian Virozoro spaces and certain quasi-Hamiltonian PSL 2 r spaces. So for one thing, the moment map has to take values in the subset with the subscript plus. And also there has to be some condition on the stabilizers because of, of this existence of finite, of, of discrete stabilizers. So there, there, there's some fine points, what exactly the spaces are. It's a bit more complicated than before, but it's very explicit. And, So in particular, one gets a correspondence between quotient orbits and conjugacy classes. Okay, well, I'm basically out of time, so I'm not sure if, if I should still give you the coordinate expressions. Um, 
maybe just, just very, very quickly, um, I hope this is not gonna ruin my talk. Uh, if, if you, you, you can express everything in terms of coordinates and then it starts looking kind of imp sort of impressive, I think. So uh, developing maps are defined by this, uh, can be expressed in terms of these lifts. Then in terms of that, you can say explicitly what this Cauchy map P is. So there's some formula like this. This is just like before with the Schwarzian derivative. Some expression, so there's a formula for the Hill potential. Um, the Hill potential we can view as, a, as some kind of function on the space of developing maps, because for each developing map we get such a Hill potential. And we can also ex from this sort of expression, this is a bit like a moral Cartan form on the space of developing maps. So some some two form, which again involves this phi. And yeah, with these two ingredients. Um, so there's this map for the hill potential and this, this strange one form. One can then explicitly write down what this two form is on the space of developing maps. So the subscripts here basically mean evaluating at the endpoint. So it's an integration from zero to one, not over the entire real line, only over, over domain. And then there's some boundary terms in the picture and, and this is basically restricting things to the boundary. So there's an explicit formula, and if you actually plug in uh, the ingredients up there and try to express everything in terms of phi, in terms of developing map directly, it gets horribly complicated. And so in some sense, there's maybe a benefit to not doing coordinate expressions and, and, and rather do it abstractly. <laughs> 